The Seattle Supersonics were the first major professional sports team in Seattle and were a huge part of the sports scene in the Pacific Northwest. So what exactly led to the team leaving the city that they called home for 40 years? In today's video, we'll take a look back at how the sale of the team turned sour after one side claimed that the other fraudulently misrepresented themselves over their true intentions of moving the team away. Before we get started, I just want to say welcome to All Sports History. This is a channel where you'll find many sports documentaries on sports leagues like the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, and much more. So please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell if you don't want to miss any of those. Okay, let's get back to today's video. Since the NBA's beginnings in 1946, the league has expanded and contracted several times, and by the late 1960s, the NBA was ready to expand the league from 10 teams to 12. The two cities that were awarded franchises were San Diego, who would become the San Diego Rockets, and later the Houston Rockets when they relocated in 1971. The other city that was granted a franchise was Seattle, when the NBA awarded the team to owners Sam Shulman and Eugene Klein. Coincidentally, both men also owned another team in San Diego, the San Diego Chargers. The team would be nicknamed the Supersonics, which was chosen through a fan vote at the time. The name Supersonics was inspired by the supersonic transport plane that Boeing was developing in Seattle. Unfortunately, mass production of the plane never became a reality due to the government contract being cancelled, but the team name stuck anyway. The team wore green, gold, and white and remained that way throughout most of their history. Initially, the Supersonics played at the Seattle Center Coliseum, which it was known at the time, from 1967 to 1978. The Coliseum originally opened as part of the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle, and it hosted the Washington State Pavilion. By the late 1970s, a brand new dome stadium opened up across town known as the Kingdom. That stadium would be home to four professional sports teams, the Seattle Seahawks, the Seattle Mariners, the Seattle Sounders, the North American Soccer League version, and the Supersonics, who moved there after the 1977-78 season. The Sonics would play there for seven years, from 1978 to 1985, and the team would make their way back to the Seattle Center at Coliseum, starting from the 1985 to 1986 season, and would play there for most of their remaining years, with the exception of the 1994 to 95 season. The Sonics temporarily played at the Tacoma Dome, while the Seattle Center Coliseum went under renovations. After which, the venue would change its name to the Key Arena. The Sonics have also had a number of different logos over the years. The first logo lasted over three years from 1967 to 1970, and it featured a basketball with the Space Needle inside of it and a supersonic plane flying around on the outside. The second logo was a little more generic as they removed the supersonic plane and the Space Needle and just left the words Seattle Supersonics. So it's not hard to believe that this logo only lasted one year during the 1971 season. Things got a little more interesting with their third logo when the Sonics decided to go all in with this 1970s font. This logo lasted for three seasons from 1972 to 75, but then the Supersonics stumbled upon arguably their greatest logo that featured a depiction of the Seattle skyline with a yellow basketball serving as the backdrop. This iconic logo would last for 20 years from 1975 to 1995, after which the Sonics embraced the 1990s by cramming as many colors as possible into their logo. In addition to their usual green and gold, they added red and a strange bronze color while also making the Space Needle a prominent feature of the logo. The team would only use this logo for 6 years before it was replaced with the Sonic's final design, which kind of looked like a cross between the Sprite and the Crush Soda logos. This Sonic's logo would last for 7 years between 2001 and 2008. In the early 1970s, the NBA was trying to close a merger deal with their rival basketball league, the ABA. The Sonics owner, Sam Shulman, was actually on the committee that oversaw the merger between the two leagues. Apparently, he grew so impatient with the merger negotiations that he threatened to move the Sonics out of the NBA and join the ABA if they didn't reach a deal. He threatened to move the Sonics to Los Angeles and become a crosstown rival to the Lakers. One of the issues holding up the merger was a lawsuit filed by basketball legend Oscar Robinson who wanted to block the merger due to a clause that allowed teams to claim a player in perpetuity rather than allowing them to explore free agency. The lawsuit was eventually settled in 1976, which allowed players to become free agents, and the merger between the two leagues was completed later that year. The Supersonics' early years weren't particularly great. They finished either near last or in some seasons closer to the middle of the pack of their division from 1967 to 1973. 
That same year, the Sonics hired legendary basketball player Bill Russell as their head coach, and he helped lead the team to the playoffs for the first time ever in 1974, while they also beat the Detroit Pistons in the first round two games to one. They would, however, lose to the eventual NBA champions, the Golden State Warriors, in the semifinals. Bill Russell would leave the head coaching position in 1977 and was replaced by Bob Hopkins. No, not Bob Hoskins, Bob Hopkins. Yep, there we go. Hopkins was actually Bill Russell's cousin and had agreed to take over after Russell left. Unfortunately, the Sonics struggled early in the 1977 season and Hopkins was replaced with Lenny Wilkins, after which the team turned around dramatically and the Sonics finished the season with 47 wins and 35 losses and went on to win the Western Conference title, clinching an appearance in the NBA Finals for the first time ever. In the Finals, they faced off against the Washington Bullets, but unfortunately, the Sonics came up short and lost the series in 7 games. However, the Supersonics would get the last laugh as the two teams would meet again a year later in the 1979 NBA Finals. This time, the Sonics beat the Bullets in 5 games, with Dennis Johnson winning Finals MVP. This would be the Supersonics' one and only title while in Seattle. The championship team of Jack Sigma, Gus Williams, John Johnson, Lenny Shelton, Dennis Johnson, and more would make one last final run through the playoffs the next year, but ultimately lost to the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. After the 1980 season, the core of the team was broken up when Dennis Johnson was traded to the Phoenix Suns and Gus Williams, seen here posing for his LinkedIn profile picture, sat out the season due to a contract dispute. The Sonics fell into last place, finishing with a record of 34 wins and 48 losses. Interestingly, during this time, the Super Sonics unveiled the first of its kind television cable subscription service called Sonic Super Channel, which allowed viewers to watch every Sonics game for $1.33 or for $120 a season. The Super Channel would last three seasons until the 1984-85 season when it was shut down for good. The owner of the Sonics, Sam Shulman, decided to sell the team in 1983 to Barry Ackerley, a businessman who made his fortune through advertising and media companies. Even though they struggled for most of the 1980s, the Supersonics had a surprising eventful 1986-87 season. Seattle hosted the NBA All-Star Game at the Kingdome on February 8, 1987. This was actually the second time Seattle had hosted the NBA All-Star Game after first hosting it in 1974 and it would also be the last time Seattle would host an all-star game. The Sonics power forward, Tom Chambers, seen here manspreading with his cowboy hat, was awarded all-star MVP after scoring 34 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 steals. After finishing the regular season with a losing record of 39 wins and 43 losses, they still managed to make the playoffs as a 7th seed in the Western Conference. In the first round, they stunned the 2nd seed Dallas Mavericks by beating them 3 games to 1, the Sonics then moved on to the semifinals by facing the Houston Rockets and upsetting and defeating them in six games. The magical run, however, came to an end when the Sonics faced their longtime rivals, the Los Angeles Lakers, in the Western Conference Finals. The Lakers would sweep the Sonics in four games and eventually would go on to win the NBA Finals. The Supersonics' fortunes had begun to turn around in the late 1980s when the team drafted future All-Star Sean Kemp in 1989 and a year later drafted future Hall of Famer Gary Payton in 1990. But the team really turned around starting in 1992 with the hiring of head coach George Carl, where he helped lead the team through a number of successful seasons. During the 1992-93 season, the Sonics finished with a record of 55 wins and 27 losses and ended up going all the way to the Western Conference Finals. They would face off against the favored Phoenix Suns, as depicted here on Tom Cruise's shirt from the movie Jerry Maguire. The Suns were pushed all the way to 7 games by the Sonics and ended up defeating Seattle in the final game. The Supersonics improved upon their record the next season with 63 wins and 19 losses, giving them the best record in the NBA that season. However, the team was shocked and upset by the Denver Nuggets who beat them in the first round after 5 games. This would earn the Sonics the dubious distinction of becoming the first number 1 seed team to lose to an A seed team during the playoffs. The following season, the Sonics once again returned to the playoffs, finishing in 2nd place in the Pacific Division. But once again, the Sonics were eliminated in the first round by the Lakers in four games. Seattle's best chance of making the finals came in the 1995-1996 season when the Sonics bested their own single season record with 64 wins and 18 losses. They faced the Sacramento Kings in the first round and swept them in four games. 
in the semifinals, they would sweep again by beating the Houston Rockets in four games, which advanced them to the Western Conference Finals. In a back and forth series against the Utah Jazz, the Sonics were forced to play a Game 7 when the Utah Jazz beat them in Game 6, 118-83. But in a close final game, the Sonics narrowly defeated the Jazz 90-86, clinching their first appearance in the finals since 1979. Heading into the finals, the Chicago Bulls were heavily favored due to having future Hall of Famers Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, and Hall of Fame coach Phil Jackson on their team. The series got out to a terrible start for the Sonics, losing the first three games in a row and staring down an embarrassing sweep. The Supersonics rebounded by winning Game 4 thanks due in part to a change in strategy of allowing Gary Payton to defend Michael Jordan. In Game 5, the Sonics once again defeated the Bulls, pushing the series to 6 games and a potential upset. However, in Game 6, Chicago's Dennis Rodman repeated his incredible defensive performance from Game 2, which helped the Bulls defeat the Sonics 4 games to 2. The 1996 NBA Finals trip would turn out to be significant as it marked the last time the Supersonics franchise would make the Finals. The team would, however, make the playoffs again over the next couple of seasons, advancing to the semifinals both times. However, they would lose to the Houston Rockets in 7 games in 1997 and to the Los Angeles Lakers in 5 games in 1998. After the season, head coach George Carl was fired after back-to-back second-round playoff eliminations, but it probably didn't help that he didn't get along very well with Sonics general manager Wally Walker. The supersonic stretch of playoff runs throughout the 90s had come to an end, as over the next decade, the team would only make the playoffs another three times. However, a surprise playoff run did come in 2005, when the Sonics won their division and made it all the way to the semifinals against the San Antonio Spurs. The Sonics had all-star Rashad Lewis and future Hall of Famer Ray Allen help them push the series to six games, but the Sonics ultimately were defeated by the eventual NBA champions, the Spurs. 2005 would mark the beginning of the end for the Supersonics time in Seattle, as this was the last time the team would make the playoffs. The Supersonics first owner, Sam Shulman, seen here posing for the cover of Hard Nipples Monthly, and the team's second owner, Barry Ackerley, seen here with Patrick Ewing, both realizing at the same time that they've made a huge mistake. The two provided stable and consistent ownership of the Sonics for the first 33 years. That would all change when in 2001, Ackerley decided to sell the franchise to a new buyer. The team was sold to Starbucks founder Howard Schultz, along with many others who bought a minority stake in the Sonics, 58 other partners to be exact. Schultz would only end up owning the team for 5 years, during which the Sonics struggled greatly financially. Hoping to turn things around, Schultz sought financial help from the state of Washington in funding for a new arena someplace around the Seattle area. After failing to come to an agreement over financing of a new arena, or even the cost of renovating the key arena, Schultz felt that he had no choice but to sell the team. The key arena at the time was the smallest venue in the NBA, only seating a little over 17,000 fans. Even the sale of the team was a struggle, as Schultz initially preferred to sell the team to a local Seattle-based group, but no local groups panned out. The Sonics were then shopped around to ownership groups from St. Louis, Kansas City, Las Vegas, Anaheim, and San Jose before Schultz agreed to sell to an ownership group based out of Oklahoma City. Clay Bennett, a former part owner of the San Antonio Spurs, had become an instrumental part in helping the New Orleans Hornets, as they were known at the time, relocate to Oklahoma City for two seasons following the devastating aftermath of Hurricane Katrina on the city of New Orleans. During this time, Bennett formed a group interested in buying an NBA franchise, and on October 24, 2006, the $350 million deal between Howard Schultz and Bennett was formalized by the other NBA owners. Part of this deal required Bennett to pursue in good faith and best efforts for at least one year in trying to secure a new arena in the Seattle metropolitan area. However, pretty much right at the same time, Seattle passed Initiative 91, which prohibited public taxpayer dollars from being used to build arenas for either the Sonics or its sister team, the Seattle Storm. Early the following year, Bennett proposed using tax money to fund a $500 million arena just outside Seattle in Renton, Washington. Unfortunately, that deal never materialized as Bennett failed to convince legislators on the new arena and by April of 2007, Bennett had backed away from the plan completely. Not long after that, 
Concerns were raised in August 2007 when Aubrey McClendon, a minority owner in the Sonics, mentioned in the Oklahoma City newspaper, The Journal Record, that the Supersonics were not bought with the intention of keeping them in Seattle, but rather to relocate them to Oklahoma City. Bennett tried to distance himself from the comment, saying that McClendon was not speaking on behalf of the ownership group. However, the NBA went ahead and fined McClendon a quarter of a million dollars for the comments. Hands up, scuzzbag! Nah, not you, the smoking scuzzbag! <laughs> Chill out, dude, I'll pay the fine! Despite Bennett's public comments about the Sonics' commitment to Seattle, moves were already underway to try and break the deal the Sonics had with the city. On September 21, 2007, Bennett sought legal arbitration on whether the Sonics could leave the key arena early by continuing the pay to lease but not having the Sonics actually play in the arena. The city pushed back stating that part of the lease specifically mentions that the team must play all of their home games at the key arena through September 2010. Because of this, a judge rejected Bennett's request for arbitration on the issue. A month later, just a day after the Sonics' first game of the season, Bennett informed the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern, that he planned to officially move the Supersonics to Oklahoma City as soon as it was legally possible. At this point, a year had passed since the team was sold to Bennett's group, which meant that they were no longer legally obligated to look for a new arena in the Seattle area. To make matters worse for Sonics fans, Bennett publicly stated that the team would not be for sale and that he would not entertain any offers from local groups to keep the team in Seattle. However, there was one other attempt to renovate the key arena by Microsoft CEO at the time, Steve Ballmer, who now owns the LA Clippers. You don't think we can win some ball games this year with Paul and Kawhi on our team? We're gonna win some ball games. He offered to pay for half of the $300 million needed to bring the key arena up to date, while the city of Seattle and King County would pay the rest. Unfortunately, the deal was not approved by the state legislator by the April 10th, 2008 deadline. In early 2008, voters in Oklahoma City approved of a $120 million renovation to the Ford Center, now known as Chesapeake Arena, as well as the construction of an NBA practice facility. A few days later, Bennett and Oklahoma City came to an agreement on a 15-year lease of the Ford Center, and to sweeten the potential move, the Oklahoma State Legislator also approved of a bill that would give the Sonics ownership group tax breaks and other initiatives if the team moved to OKC. At this point, it was all but inevitable that the Supersonics would leave Seattle for Oklahoma, and on April 18, 2008, the NBA owners approved in a vote 28-2 to allow the Sonics to leave Seattle for OKC. The two dissenting votes were from the Dallas Mavericks' Mark Cuban and the Portland Trailblazers' Paul Allen. With the approval formalized, the Sonics would now be able to move to OKC for the start of the 2008-2009 season. Part of the deal between Clay Bennett and Seattle was that he had to pay $45 million to break the Sonics' lease on the key arena early, while also promising to pay another $30 million if no other NBA team came to Seattle by 2013. Howard Schultz seen here taking in the smooth sounds of a Sonics game with jazz musician Kenny G, for his part, regretted the decision to sell the team to Clay Bennett and his group. Schultz stated, Selling the Sonics as I did is one of the biggest regrets of my professional life. I should have been willing to lose money until a local buyer emerged. In one final attempt to block the move, Howard Schultz sued Clay Bennett's ownership group, stating that they did not act in good faith in finding a suitable site for an arena in the Seattle area. Schultz used publicly released email exchanges between members of Bennett's ownership group, openly discussing how they preferred to move the team to OKC. Bennett claimed that the emails were taken out of context and that his group had spent millions of dollars in trying to keep the Sonics in Seattle. Eventually, the NBA stepped in and filed a motion in a Seattle federal court stating that Schultz's lawsuit against Bennett would put the Sonics franchise in an unstable situation and that the NBA would be forced to take control of the team itself. The NBA also stated that Schultz had signed an agreement that prevented him from suing Bennett's group prior to the original sale of the team. A little later, Schultz conceded that it would be difficult to win his case against Bennett with the NBA intervening, and so he dropped the lawsuit in August of 2008. In another last gut punch to the fans in Seattle, the Sonics before they left drafted three promising talented players in Kevin Durant, the second overall pick in 2007, Russell Westbrook, the fourth overall pick in 2008, and Serge Ibaka, who was the 24th overall pick of that same year. The three would later be joined by James Harden, who was drafted third overall in 2009, 
and became the first player in Oklahoma City history to be drafted. With the move to Oklahoma City complete, the Seattle Supersonics officially changed their name to the Oklahoma City Thunder on September 3, 2008. The four recently drafted players would become the foundational core of a dominant team, helping lead the Thunder to their first NBA Finals appearance in 2012. They faced off against another dominant group of four in LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and old Supersonics veteran Ray Allen. The Heat would end up defeating the Thunder in five games, earning James and Bosh their first championships. Part of the exit negotiations with Seattle was that the Thunder would not use the Supersonics name, nor would they use the team's colors. But there seems to be some discrepancies over the exact details of who owns what in the Seattle-Oklahoma City breakup. Based on the research that I found, OKC got to keep the trademark on the Supersonics name and their history, but they left the Supersonics championship trophy, banners, and retired jerseys in Seattle to be displayed at the Museum of History and Industry. Technically, the Thunder still own the Sonics history, but this in effect leaves the door open for a new ownership group in Seattle to purchase the naming rights to the Supersonics from the Thunder if the NBA awards a new team or another team decides to move to Seattle. In the years since the Sonics moved away, there's been a number of teams rumored to be thinking about relocating to the Northwest. Some teams like the Atlanta Hawks and Milwaukee Bucks briefly considered Seattle as a potential move, but have since been sold to new ownership groups who, as a part of their sale, were required to keep the teams in their current market. One team to note was the Sacramento Kings, who possibly came the closest to actually moving to Seattle. In 2011, a group of investors led by Chris Hansen Why don't you have a seat right over here for me? No, not that Chris Hansen. Yep, that Chris Hansen, who is a hedge fund manager from the Seattle area. He began buying up real estate near the Seahawks and Mariners home stadiums with the intention of building a new arena in that area. He later came to an agreement with the city of Seattle on privately financing the construction of an arena. Meanwhile, the Sacramento Kings had long been trying to find a solution to building a new arena themselves, but like many other teams, failed in their attempts to get public support behind it. By early 2013, a tentative agreement had been reached between Hansen's group and the Malou family who owned the Sacramento Kings on the sale and relocation of the team. Upon hearing of this agreement, David Stern and the NBA once again stepped in and thwarted a potential sale of the team. With the help of the league office, the city of Sacramento formed an alternate group of investors who would try to keep the team in Sacramento. This alternative group was headed by businessman Vivek Ranadive, who would later be joined by Shaquille O'Neal, who bought a 5% stake in the Kings. Long story short, the NBA owners eventually went to a vote between relocating the Kings or keeping them in Sacramento, and the owners voted 22-8 to in favor of staying in Sacramento. The Kings eventually got their new arena when the Golden 1 Arena opened in 2016. There is a potential glimmer of hope though for Sonic fans. On December 4th, 2018, the National Hockey League unanimously approved the expansion of the league by adding a new franchise in Seattle. This was due in part thanks to the renovations of the key arena, now known as Climate Pledge Arena. Starting in October of 2018, the Climate Pledge Arena underwent a massive overhaul, costing around $900 million. The renovation plan ultimately led to the NHL approving of the expansion to Seattle, which in all likelihood helps increase the chances of the NBA hopefully expanding into Seattle sometime in the future. So what do you guys think about the Sonics moving to Oklahoma City? Should the NBA have stepped in and intervened like they did? Let me know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and feel free to share with anyone else who might also enjoy it. For more sports history, check out my website at allsportshistory.com and be sure to follow All Sports History's social media pages, which I posted the links to in the description below. And thanks for watching.